This gun's got a heavy recoil. It won't stand still. And we got just three seconds to nail the president. Let's make my plans and carry him out. That's what John Wilkes Booth thought, too. Booth? <laughs> I'm no actor. Busting my leg on a stage so I can yell down with the tyrants. If Booth wasn't such a ham, he might have made it. He got pretty far at that, though. The guy who killed Garfield didn't make it either. Him? He didn't plan anything. Just took a lucky shot, strictly left-handed, just like McKinley. And Zangara got the cheer for his try at Roosevelt. He had to try it in a crowd. I hate crowds. They're commies. They're enemy agents. <laughs> All right, who is behind it, Baron? I haven't the slightest idea. No feeling against the president. I'm just earning a living. By treason. Ace those craps. Don't give me that politics, Jazz. It's not my racket. I don't even know who's paying me, and I don't want to know. What's the difference? Didn't it occur to you why they want you to do it? Certainly it did. But that makes them suckers, not me. I'm the guy who's getting it made. A half a million clams for absolutely nothing. Because tonight at 5 o'clock, I kill the president. One second after 5, there's a new president. What changes? Nothing. What are they paying for? Nothing. Otherwise, I wouldn't have taken a job, Sheriff. About 200 yards. Baron, isn't that a German rifle? Yeah. You know it? I know it. From Dallas, we got word of some of the details of how President Kennedy died today as the doctors who attended him were able for the first time to sort of collect their thoughts over that tragic half hour that they fought for his life yesterday. They say at Parkland Hospital that it was really of no use to try to help the president, that they, he was beyond help when he reached the hospital within five minutes of the shooting. They said that the bullet that entered his neck came out the back of his head and it was quite clear when well, he how did it happen? Uh, who saw it happen? We have some eyewitness reports. ABC's Bill Lord interviewed some people. First, a Dallas policeman, an eyewitness to the shooting. Uh, Jim Cheney, I understand that you were riding next to the president's car when the assassination took place. I was riding on the right rear fender of what happened. Well, we had proceeded west on uh, Elm Street uh, at approximately 15 to 20 miles an hour. When we heard the first shot, I thought it was a motorcycle backfiring. And uh, I looked back over to my left, and uh, also President Kennedy looked back over his left shoulder. Then the, uh, the second shot came, I looked, uh, I looked back just in time to see the president struck in the face by the second bullet. President Kennedy, we are now informed, was shot in the right temple. Well, well, Bob, from the point where they think the man with the gun might have been seen yeah. to where the president was actually felled, would it have been possible for him to have been struck by a bullet in the right temple? We know that Mr. Kennedy was hit in the right it's temple. Shown, of course, that the president was killed by one shot that struck him in the right temple. He died of a gunshot wound in the brain. Dr. Berkeley told me it's a, a simple matter, Tom, of, uh, of a bullet right through the head. This uh, hypothesis that the assailant was in the building I described is true, but this conflicts with the fact that the wound in the neck, the doctors say, was in the front of the neck, just below the Adam's apple. I was having lunch in the main cafeteria in the hospital when an emergency page arrived for Dr. Tom Shires, chief of surgery. Knowing that he was presenting a paper out of town, we picked up the page. Dr. Ronald Jones, surgery resident, myself, they informed us that the president had been shot and was being brought to the emergency room. We went there immediately, and he had just been brought in. It was obvious initially that he had a severe lethal wound. And arriving at the emergency room, uh, Dr. Carrico had placed a tube in the president's trachea to assist his breathing. But there was a neck wound anteriorly and a large wound of his head in the right posterior area. Most of the doctors and nurses who treated the president at Parkland did see a large wound at the rear of the head. Dr. Robert McClelland. It was in the right back part of the head, very large. Nurse Audrey Bell. You know, there was a massive wound at the back of his head. Dr. Charles Carrico. There was a... Uh, 
a, a large, uh, quite a large defect about here on his, on his skull. Dr. Ronald Jones. Well, my impression was that, that there was a wound in, in this area of the head, right in, right in this area. Dr. Paul Peters. Right about there is where I thought the hole was. Occipital parietal. Dr. Kenneth Salyer. Into the temporal parietal, back into the parietal area, which is, this is the parietal bone right here. And this wound extended into the parietal, into the parietal area. Dr. Charles Crenshaw. And you'll hold right here on your ear to the back. And this bone that's on the back of your head is called the occiput. Right between these two points was the large exit wound, about two and three-fourths of an inch, the size of my fist. Dr. Richard Delaney. Uh, so that was my remembering of, uh, of what I saw. He shot to kill. He shot with deadly accuracy. Using a bolt-action rifle, he fired three bullets unusually swiftly, as if he had trained for this murder for a long time. A definite air of anticipation has built up here in downtown Dallas, Dallas in front of the county jail. The county jail is where 24-year-old Lee Oswald is expected to be brought any time now. And if you'll join me over here, why we'll let the audience in the theater and the audience at home know exactly what your line is. I will admit we're being tricky, and we have uh, perhaps three and a half minutes to see what you can do. We'll tell you that Miss Kane is self-employed and deals in a service, and we'll begin with Dorothy Kilgallen. Could I use your service, Miss Kane? I think so. Uh, could Mr. Randall? Yes. You're quite sure about him, aren't you? Reasonably. Well... You may be, Miss Kane. <laughs> If we had need of your service, would we go to you rather than ringing you up and summoning you? Dorothy Kilgallen, sharp-witted TV personality and skillful journalist. From the 1930s to the 60s, Kilgallen was one of the most powerful women in print. With a single mention, the cunning columnist could make or break a career. She was a wonderful writer, wonderful reporter. Dorothy, st stop the presses, tear out the front page, if I got a story for you. Is it bigger than a bread box? <laughs> If you got on her bad side, she'd let you have it. This is Milton Berle. Oh, there's a product involved. Product? Corn. <laughs> Dorothy was, despite the controversy that swirls around her, a very bright and very good reporter of criminal cases, one of the best ever. She had uh, stumbled across something really big. She didn't know too much. Uh, her death is very mysterious. I mean, if they killed the president, they're not going to worry about a Broadway columnist like Dorothy Kilgallen, right? November 1963. The country was thrown into turmoil when President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Lee Harvey Oswald was accused of the killing. Then Oswald was shot dead by Jack Ruby. Enter Dorothy Kilgallen, star reporter and columnist for New York's Journal American. The inquisitive journalist landed a secret interview with Ruby during his incarceration in Dallas. The following March, Kilgallen wrote in her column, the point in this historic case is that the whole truth has not been told. Biographer Johnny Whiteside. She was interviewing all sorts of people really deep, deep into the case and running just series after series of stories in the New York Journal American that were asking a lot of seemingly unanswerable questions. She started saying this has to be a conspiracy. But before Dorothy had a chance to publish her findings, the 52-year-old writer was found dead in a New York City townhouse. How she wound up that way is anyone's guess. I think it's highly suspicious that Dorothy dies after saying she's going to bust this case wide open and have the scoop of the century, the biggest story of all time. Are you an adorable gentleman who is noted for one particular feature? <laughs> Alone amongst the mainstream press reporters, Dorothy began harboring suspicions that the so-called open and shut case against Lee Harvey Oswald was not so open and shut. Dorothy 
was finding dissident witnesses, uh, deposing them, publishing their testimony. She was going to Dallas. She was threatening to, to, to publish finally and saying it would be the biggest story of her life. Dorothy somehow obtained the Warren Commission report testimony given by Jack Ruby while he was in prison, while it was still classified top secret. She had found, I think, several hundred discrepancies in the Warren Commission report. All our phones were tapped because they were trying to figure out how she had gotten them. She said she was going to blow the JFK assassination case wide open and have the scoop of the century. She was able to obtain the first interview with Jack Ruby in prison and the only interview with Jack Ruby where the reporter was alone with him in an unbugged room where, in other words, where Ruby felt free to talk. I knew that she could have gotten a lot out of Jack Ruby because she had that technique. She gave hints that something was coming up that she had stumbled on to something. She would say, I'm going to New Orleans. I've got to meet a man there. It's all very cloak and daggerish. I wondered a lot about this so-called folder that she had. She brought it into the dressing room at What's My Line and said, here's all the stuff that I've learned and uh, I'm working on it. Nobody can have a look at it. In the summer of 1965, Dorothy was suddenly swept off her feet by a shady out-of-towner. This person I referred to as uh, this, the new man in her life is suddenly romancing her and his sudden interest in her was prompted by somebody, not necessarily himself, but prompted by some faction. Through her research and the interview with Jack Ruby and the other witnesses that she had contacted, she was convinced that it was conspiracy. Kilgallen was racing to finish a book about the assassination titled Murder One. She was also in love again, this time with a mystery man from out of town. She was involved with this newspaper man from Ohio, and that made her terribly happy. Jean Bach's husband, Bob Bach, had a couple of cocktails with Dorothy on the night of November 7th, 1965. I knew she did the drinks with Bob. They'd been at Clark's. I think she said, just drop me off at the um, Regency. So she was having a late date that night. She was seen again at the Regency Hotel, which was said to have been the trysting place of herself and the out of town. She disappeared into the reddish dark of the Regency Lounge, and that was the last time anybody who would admit to seeing Dorothy saw her that night. The next morning, the body of Dorothy Kilgallen was discovered in her Upper East Side townhouse. The official cause of death was later determined to be acute ethanol and barbiturate intoxication circumstances undetermined. In other words, she died from too much pills and liquor. She was found dead in her bed with a book called The Honey Badger by Robert Ruark next to her open. She could not read without her reading glasses and they were all the way across the room far out of reach. A number of other people including the medical examiner and the police detective have made statements or allegations that the death seemed staged. And get this, without much poking around, the cops came to the immediate decision that Kilgallen's death was an accident. Dorothy was known to throw back a few drinks, combine the alcohol with too many sleeping pills, and there you have it, case closed. But a more in-depth look at the facts revealed something interesting. Dorothy was not a smoker, and the medical examiner's report showed an inordinate amount of nicotine in her. What disturbs me is that there was absolutely no nada investigation of her death at the time. The head of toxicology at the time had a beaker of extract from Dorothy's brain and stomach. It was kept uh, virtually on, on ice. Thirteen years after Kilgallen's death, the beaker was still on ice. That is, until biographer Lee Israel did some digging of her own and had the extract analyzed. Substance from her stomach bespoke the, the presence of three different kinds of slow-acting sleeping pills, which is exactly what you would do, I suppose, if you were a kiss-and-kill uh, kind of guy who was uh, dispatched by the CIA or by whomever. A kiss-and-kill kind of guy like, say, the mysterious out-of-towner? If enough people believed that she had the scoop on, on what really happened, that would probably 
impel them into some violent action. So it was she had notes and notes and notes about it, which after her death disappeared. The file was supposedly very thick. It was suspected that it was either stolen or her husband had it and may have destroyed it. Her husband, Richard Colmar, the actor-producer, was asked what was in Dorothy's file. He said, I'm afraid that's a secret that will have to go to the grave with me. And so it did. Colmar committed suicide in 1971. He has been at Dallas Police Headquarters about a mile and a half or two miles from this location since his arrest yesterday afternoon for the assassination of President Kennedy. But police indicate that they are perhaps finished questioning Oswald for perhaps a short time, and we're expecting Oswald to be brought here to the county jail, which is where prisoners normally are. President, 29-year-old Ricky White says his father was part of a CIA plot to kill the president. CNN's Mike Capps reports. Ricky White and several investigators who've been following the case told reporters that Roscoe White was a CIA operative posing as a Dallas policeman. White produced documents he insists substantiate his claims, faded messages from intelligence officials ordering the assassination, messages refuted by CIA officials. There was a firing squad in Dealey Plaza on November 22, 1963. Beyond a reasonable doubt, that Roscoe Anthony White was one of the members of that firing squad. Ricky White told reporters that eight years ago he found a diary belonging to his father. Notes inside detail Roscoe White's involvement. Notes that indicated Roscoe White plotted with Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby to kill the president. The notes indicated Ricky White's mother worked for Dallas nightclub owner Jack Ruby and that Mrs. White overheard her husband and Ruby discussing the assassination plot. Ruby fatally shot Oswald two death of the Kennedy assassination. It's something that I would not share with anybody else besides myself. When I found the diary, that it was shocking, most incredible that one individual in this room could ever find. Because this guy never gave the impression of being a bad guy. Ricky White says the diary indicates Oswald was a part of the plot, but did not fire any shots. White also says his father is the one who really killed Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett. The policeman who it is long thought caught Oswald after the assassination, but allegedly was gunned down by the escaping Oswald. White told reporters Monday that his father set up on the grassy knoll behind a big tree and a picket fence along the president's parade route. Other CIA operatives, using code names, set up in the records building in the school book depository. There were six shots fired totally in David Platt. Two came from the book depository, which his name was Lebanon. The man in the record building was solved and was shot. Two shots, six shots fired total. Ricky White says his father died suspiciously in a fire at his job in 1971. White believes a witness elimination team activated after Kennedy's death killed his father. And White says his father's diary disappeared after an FBI agent looked at it. What I heard today does provide, in some instances, uh, plausible sounding answers to some of those questions and I think it bears uh, further, uh, closer look. Other experts who studied the assassination disagree. You know, people want to believe this story. They want to believe this conspiracy, and they're going to believe it. This one, some others, there are over 300 of them now, and so I guess they're going to have a little, little fun out of it. Ricky White wants this information and the entire case turned over to the Texas Attorney General, apparently not trusting federal investigators. But no matter the outcome, White believes his information will not solve the Kennedy assassination case. Mike Capps, CNN, Dallas. Ricky White has a startling theory on the assassination of John F. Kennedy. He says his father, with two other men, fired on the presidential motorcade on that fateful day in Dallas. It is his claim that his father, Roscoe White, was actually the one to fire the shot that mortally wounded the president. How'd you find this out, Rick? It was in 1995 when I had come across a part in the diary, but I found the diary... Your father in, kept the diary? Yes, sir. I found the diary in 1982 when my grandfather had passed away in Paris, Texas. And uh, from that point on, I took the diary back to Midland, Texas with uh, other material that was located in the footlocker that I found there in Paris. This is your father now? Yes, sir. My father's footlocker that he had placed there at my grandfather's place in Paris, Texas. I see. So you went to your grandfather's place, your father was still living? No, sir. He was killed in 1971. Okay. So he was dead a long time then. Yes, you sir. were a young man. Yes, sir. 
How old were you when he died? I was 10 years old. Okay. So you go to your, your grandfather passes away, you go to your grandfather's house, collect all this stuff, and your father's stuff was there. Yes, sir. And three years, call me Larry, okay? Okay, Larry. Three years later, you find what? I, uh, three years later, I come to a part in the diary. It was an everyday uh, event that he would place into the diary. He was a police officer. Uh, he was a police officer for the Dallas Police Department, and I come across a part in the diary where it stated that uh, him and two other men were in a part of the assassination. He was, uh, it started out that he, him, himself was Mandarin, uh, was located behind, a gra uh, behind the stockade fence, and uh, that Lebanon was in the sixth floor uh, book depository. That would be Oswald. Uh, no, Oswald was not one of the shooters in the Kennedy assassination. Uh, Oswald was probably in the book depository, but was not one of the shooters in Daly Plaza. Saul was on the top of the records building, and they, what they had was a triangular shooting fire at the motorcade. That's the diary date of Friday, November 22nd. That's, yes, sir. What did he have on November 21st? Did he write, tomorrow we're going to kill the president? No, he never did. What he had stated was that him and a few other men had met the day before and had uh, corroborated uh, the plans before the next day. And that was what the assassination would be, the November the 21st. Second. Did he enlarge at all on the on who Lee, Lee Harvey was and how that whole scenario took place? No, sir. He no, Larry, no, he never did. He just said he shot and two other guys shot. Shot. That's correct. Did he write why they shot? Yes, because the men in the uh, buildings would be diversion for the man behind the picket fence. And what it would be is they would fire first, given the diversion of the people maybe looking up towards the buildings when he would fire the fatal shot to the throat. Your father was how old? He would have been 28 years old at the time. Why do you want to kill the president? He was asked uh, through Navy intelligence, uh, was, which was a right wing of the CIA at the time, to eliminate a national security threat. Well, what took you five years to give us this diary? It took me a long time to be able to corroborate the story, to be able to find other people that my father was involved with, I uh, mean, you went on a five-year personal investigation? No, sir. I was on, I was on a full-time job, you basis. I had to do it on a personal uh, venture until uh, 1989, and that's when I started doing this full-time. Why didn't you think of taking it, say, to the Dallas Times-Herald or Dallas Morning News or uh, New York I, Times or Washington Post or CNN or somebody and say, look, look what I got here. Let's, let's go. First, I had to prove to myself that the story was true and uh, to investigate it and in my ideals at the time that i was never going to bring the story public i wanted to it's your uh, father i know that and it's hurt me very deeply to come forward to tell the story what proved it to you it was the diary in 1995 that i know but you said you had to go out to prove it was there any yeah when i started investigating the kennedy assassination corroborating through other individuals that my father was plotted and into the assassination is when I came forward to a businessman in Midland, Texas and asked him if he would be interested in uh, hearing the story, and he was. And at the time, it was just strictly a one-on-one -on -one, uh, individual that he was interested in finding out who was involved in the Kennedy assassination. Where's the diary now? Uh, I would believe that now it would be in the possession of the FBI. Did you, you, did you turn it over to them? No, I did not. Well, how did it disappear if it was in your possession? Well, when I, when I was taken in of May of 88 to be interrogated for the involvement of a safety deposit box is when they discovered that I had a diary. And then I had already left the federal building. I had gathered all the material up. Oh, you were being investigated because you took something from a safety deposit box? No, sir. I was investigating a safety deposit box that my father had left. And they stopped you from doing that That's and correct. took the diary. Uh, we have some statements here if you'd like to comment. Bobby Ray Inman, former CIA deputy director, after examining the messages that Roscoe White allegedly received from the CIA, said they are not legitimate. He said his reaction is that the information you gathered was a forgery or invalid. That's incorrect. I have never forged anything. I've only found facts. And this you man, got CIA stuff, information? I have uh, uh, John Stockwell, a former CIA director at the time, uh, stated that he was 90% sure that it was corroborated that they do look genuine. The FBI says that the, they received this information in 1988, as you state, but, quote, determined that this information is not credible, end quote. That's what they had told me in May of 88 when I was in there being interrogated. 
Uh, they denied me. They told me it was not true. And I'd known then at that time that I was not going to get any cooperation of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And the Dallas Police Department told the producers of Larry King Live that it was unlikely your father would have been on day work at that time. He would probably still be in the academy. The Dallas Police Department does verify that he was employed. Well, that's correct, but my father did not go to the academy until after January of 1964. So he was employed with the Dallas Police Department three months prior to him going to the academy. As a patrolman? No, sir. He was in the crime scenes as a photographer. We'll be right back with Ricky White. We'll include your phone calls. This is Larry King Live. Our guest is uh, Ricky White, uh, the 29-year-old oil equipment salesman who has just come out with this story. By the way, people backing his claims are his mother and your father's preacher, right, as well as the JFK Assassination Information Center. Right. Your mother says that her husband killed the president. That's correct. Um, why didn't you forget all this, Rick, and burn the diary? Well, it was because of my mother that I'm standing up and telling the people today. It's because that without her pushing me on and wanting the story to be told, is the reason why I'm trying to tell it. But, but if everything jibes and we now accept this, you have taken and painted your family, the father, your, in, 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 in the mode of John Wilkes Booth, among the, the, the worst of our citizens ever to kill a president by shooting him from behind. But it'd be worse not to tell the story and hold it behind. It is better to tell a story and let the people know the truth. And the truth is what tells for it all. Jonesboro, Georgia. Hello. Uh, yes, sir. I'd like to know if this is propaganda for a movie. And if it's not, why would he disgrace his name? And you, uh, is this going to be a movie or a book? Ne neither one. We strictly went public for the safety of my family and everybody that was involved. In oh, it. you feared for your lives. That's correct. Laurel, Maryland. Hello. Yes, Larry. How you doing tonight? Fine. Uh, I was asking, I saw his press conference, and he stated that the government told his father to do it. Why would, he, why would the government tell his father to kill the President of the United States? Because he was a national security threat to the government at the time. I mean, the CIA wanted him eliminated. There are many who thought that. Jim Garrison, now judge in Louisiana, thought that the CIA wanted the President eliminated. They thought he was, it was a right-wing element of the That's CIA. That's correct, uh-huh. A right-wing from the CIA. It wasn't the, actually the CIA, it was people that was up above him. Did you talk to your mother about him, your father, and why, oh, did she know he was going to do it that day he did it? No, he, she sure did. And I, I think she had the uh, emption because she had overheard in two different conversations uh, with Jack Ruby that, uh, that they were plotting to eliminate uh, John F. Kennedy. Your father died how many years later? Uh, he died in 1971. And Eight years later? Yes, sir. Of natural no. causes? No, he was an explosion at m, m Equipment Company, and it was a false... Uh, uh, it wasn't, uh, uh, he basically had gone on a break for about 15 minutes and had returned and somebody had cut in the settling hoses inside there and the room had filled up with settling and there was a five gallon ga uh, gas can that was delivered from aerial chemical that was placed up under the, the, the uh, welding table and uh, when he uh, arched a uh, flint and an explosion. They were saying they killed him. That's correct. Are the other two people, too, who are in the diary? I have, we have no earthly idea. We're right now in, in the research of finding those two men. We'll be back. Joining us now is Baptist Minister Jack Shaw. Jack was at Roscoe White's deathbed. And, Jack, I understand Roscoe actually lived for about 48 hours after his accident, um, and you were able to talk to him. What did he tell you? We talked about several things, but at the beginning of the conversation, he talked about uh, what happened. We discussed that, and he said that, he had uh, gone on a break, and he came back off the break, and uh, there was a, a, under the bench, there was a can that he was in a hurry to get home that day, and, and he fired up the welding torch, and the explosion happened. And he also said that uh, he saw someone leaving the scene uh, in a hurry when he was coming back in from the break. So the point was he indicated to you that he believed that... Uh this was not an accident. Yes, I, I, yes, he indicated that to me, yes. Okay, now I know that you also made some 40 or 50 hours of, of audio tape um, with Roscoe's wife, Geneva. What did she tell you in your hours of interviews? Well, we talked about, we talked about a lot of things, um, but she talked about overhearing um, uh, her husband and Jack Ruby talking and, and uh, 
about the assassination and things like that. And um, and we talked about uh, many events that transpired after the assassination. Now, Jack, I understand that Geneva told you that she had a conversation with her husband where Roscoe told her why he was going to assassinate President Kennedy, that he was going to do it and why. Yes, she did. Uh, she said that Roscoe told her that Kennedy has been a pretty good president, but he has to die. He didn't carry out his own orders, and if I don't carry out my orders, I'll have to die too. Hmm. This is pretty amazing stuff. Um, do you believe her? I've I've said all along that, that I've been placed in a unique position, and uh, I don't know exactly why I've been placed here, but I'm hoping that someone will come forth with evidence that will confirm what I've been told. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm hoping for, and that's what I'm praying for. And until that happens, I, I have to remain open about this. I see. And once again, this is based on your interview with Roscoe Wife's wife, who has since passed away. Uh, Jack Shaw, thank you very much for being with us and sharing that information. Jack was interested to learn that Roscoe White was knowledgeable about photography. And in fact, he was slated to become a police photographer. Jack began to look at the Oswald backyard photos with that in mind, and he was amazed at what he found. I believe that people may have been too hasty in writing off the Roscoe White story. There are parts of it which I think may be true. While there's no solid evidence linking Roscoe to the deaths of Kennedy and Tippett, I think he may have played some role, perhaps a minor one, in the conspiracy which resulted in Kennedy's death. I believe Roscoe White was placed on the Dallas Police Force to help frame Oswald for the assassination. Notice that the person in the backyard photos has a broad, flat chin, while these pictures of Oswald show him with a pointed cleft chin, not at all like the one in the backyard photos. Now look at the chin of Roscoe White. Whose chin most closely matches the one in the backyard photos? When I first saw this photo of Roscoe White and some companions on a beach, I immediately noticed Roscoe's thick neck, square chin, and broad shoulders. I also noticed how Roscoe stands with his weight on his right foot. White was about the same height as Oswald. In fact, there were many physical similarities between the two, with the exception of the neck and chin. Roscoe had a thick neck with big sloping shoulders, while Oswald had a thin neck with narrow shoulders. When I enlarged the photos of Oswald and Roscoe to the same size and laid one over the other, I was astounded to find that the height, posture, and even some features are an identical match. I was especially impressed with the identical neck and chin of the man in the backyard photo and Roscoe White. Also, it is known that Roscoe suffered a broken right wrist which never healed properly and left a slight lump on his arm. Oswald had no such lump. In this backyard photo, there's a noticeable lump on the figure's right wrist. It certainly seems to me that the figure in the photo could be that of Roscoe White. And of course, we also have the issue of this third backyard photograph. The Dallas police and the federal government have officially stated that the backyard photos were discovered among Oswald's possessions on Saturday, November 23, 1963, the day after the assassination. They claim that only two photos, one a print and the other a print with a negative, were found. Yet in the early 1970s, this third backyard photograph was discovered by the Senate Intelligence Committee in the hands of Roscoe White's widow. This again ties Roscoe White not only to the assassination case, but specifically to the backyard photos. And there's even more. This FBI document listing photos confiscated from Oswald's belongings indicates four separate pictures showing Oswald with weapons in his backyard. Yet officially, there were only the two. Are there more? And is one the picture which was in the possession of Roscoe White? Many questions regarding the backyard photos remain unresolved. And even more have been raised. This is one of several dozen photographs the Dallas police claimed was found in Oswald's belongings. Apparently, it is a photo Oswald took while in the Marines. Uh, there are other photos of Marines and photos of Asian cities. In this photo of Oswald's Marine buddies, I found one person especially intriguing. After comparing the man in the fatigue cap in the center with many photos of Roscoe, 
I'm convinced they may well be photos of the same man. You can even see a lump on this man's right arm in the exact same place as the person in the backyard photos. I see this as further evidence that the man in Oswald's military photo may be Roscoe White. I believe Roscoe's only role in the assassination may have been to fabricate evidence to help incriminate Oswald. If this is true, it makes Roscoe White's connection to Oswald much closer than previously believed. And if White was involved in intelligence work, as stated by his son and others, then perhaps Oswald, too, was connected to U.S. intelligence, just as his mother, Marguerite, always claimed. Well, that's certainly food for thought. And the president talked with J. Edgar Hoover about the search for the assassin. He also put in a phone call to Dallas and got a report from the doctor uh, attending Governor John Connolly of Texas, who reported that the governor was in a satisfactory condition. Tonight, in a season of new movies and theories about the assassination of JFK, this report will draw lightning. A doctor who was with President Kennedy when he died breaks nearly 30 years of silence. Dr. Charles Crenshaw was in the emergency room when President Kennedy was brought in. He examined the president, saw the wounds close hand, and based on that, Dr. Crenshaw challenges the results of the Warren Commission in an eyewitness account that is rich in detail and history and emotion. Dr. Crenshaw relives for Tom Jarrell the death of the president. On a sunny autumn afternoon in Dallas, President Kennedy, the First Lady, and Texas Governor John Connolly shared the presidential limousine. They passed large, friendly crowds, a good sign for a political outing. But as the entourage reached Dealey Plaza, passing below the six-story high school book depository building, suddenly lives were shattered. We interrupt this program to bring you a special bulletin from ABC Radio. Three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade today in downtown Dallas, Texas. Almost since the day the bullets rang out here in Dealey Plaza, conspiracy theories have emerged. They've come from many sources, always suggesting a plot to kill the president with more than one gunman involved. The latest conspiracy theory comes from a respected physician who refused to speak out until his professional career was largely behind him. We've seen from news photographs what happened here on November 22nd, 1963. His views come from a small emergency room where there were no cameras present. And until now, details have been scarce. Doctor, the president we know was shot, passing on the road in his motorcade down below, and the official version has Lee Harvey Oswald firing from behind. From what you say and what you're describing, he was shot from the front. That's correct. Meaning there had to be two gunmen. At least one and maybe two more. And you believe that? I always believe that because of the wounds that I observed at Parkland Hospital. Most Today, Dr. Charles Crenshaw is chairman of the surgery department at John Peter Smith Hospital in Fort Worth. But in the early 1960s, he was a third-year resident at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, assigned to the trauma team, where he had observed hundreds of gunshot wounds. Let's recall the scene that day. A bewildered First Lady, her clothing splattered with her husband's blood, stayed by his side as he entered the hospital. Among the surgical staff rushing into this medical chaos was Dr. Crenshaw, a junior member of the emergency room team who became an eyewitness to history. We ran into the emergency room and there was bedlam, total bedlam. People were running in, uh, people were crying. Did President Kennedy have uh, any vital signs when you reached the... He had room? barely a pulse. He had an, an agonal respiration. He had no blood pressure whatsoever. Did you see the tide, his life, in effect, running out? Yes. However, God love him, Malcolm Perry, he didn't want him to die as much as all of us. He started closed chest massage, pumping on his chest, trying to make him come back or resuscitate the heart. After the medical team had done their best, had worked as hard as they could and realized it was hopeless, was there time for tears among those who had put so much emotion and effort into this? Just before the cleanup really started, there was blood and bandages on the floor. His back brace was askewed on the wall. I think it got to me the most when I looked and saw the red roses of Mrs. Kennedy in the kick bucket 
there at the head of the table, and there his blood was still dripping on it. I was, felt helpless. I wished we could have done more. I mean, here we had trained all our lives, and we'd lost the President of the United States, and nobody wanted to be around. And Mrs. Kennedy came in, and she stopped and kissed his great toe. And then she went on the right side to hold his hand. And at that time, she took her ring off and put it on his small finger. And then he was wrapped in a sheet and we placed him in the coffin. But before we did, I looked at the wound again. I wanted to know and remember this the rest of my life. And the rest of my life, I will always know he was shot from the front. This bullet to the head was beyond a doubt the fatal wound, which is clearly seen in the Zapruder home movie. However, the film is not as conclusive on the crucial issue of the bullet's direction. Did the shot come from behind Kennedy or from the front? Remember, the Warren Commission investigation concluded the shots came only from behind. Dr. Crenshaw says they're wrong. The bullet struck about where and passed about where? From here right. through. And taking out the... The back or the occipital part. The back of your head. This was gone. Uh, in our view, and we, that's the reason we could see the cerebellum. Had the bullet come from the back, uh, what would have been the difference? It would the have been much different. It would have gone a little more anterior and be a bigger blaster. Right. The second wound? The second wound was here in the throat, right above the necktie. It was a small opening, very small, three to five millimeters, about the size of your little finger. In a slow motion study of the film, President Kennedy grabs his throat with both hands, reacting, Crenshaw believes, as if he is shot from the front. Compounding the mystery is this photograph of the government's autopsy, showing a gaping wound in the president's neck. A tracheostomy incision was done at Parkland over the site of the bullet wound. Crenshaw says someone tampered with that wound after he last saw Kennedy's body, making it larger to resemble a bullet exit wound. Look, this is the size of the tracheostomy tube. Mm -hmm. Incision was made and then placed in. This large part, this flange, stays outside. So it was a small wound about the size of the, the instrument uh, that uh, you Right. Saw. An inch to an inch and a half maximum. This wound, and described in the Warren Commission, was almost three inches wide. Double the size. Eh? Double. Is it possible that the doctor uh, working to put this in what may have been already a bullet wound uh, made the incision too large? Oh, no. No, Perry was an artist with the blade. Mm. He was one of the best trained technical surgeons. But it seems almost incomprehensible that a team of highly intelligent, highly trained doctors could be standing over the President of the United States and see wounds that you say came from the front and yet the official government story is it came from the back and wait this long to break the silence. Intimidation, fear, and career-mindedness. Those were the factors. Exactly. But again, you have to understand the time in 1963, the people that were with this country were telling you what to do, how to do it, and I think uh, the feeling was we went along to get along. Now semi-retired, Dr. Crenshaw has written a book breaking nearly 30 years of silence. Could the, what you call, a conspiracy of silence have been out of plain old-fashioned patriotism among the doctors? No question about that. And Dr. Baxter had wanted no one to say anything because he was worried about commercialization. Well, I made the statement that any one of us uh, in the school or in the hospital that ever made a dime off of anything they said about the assassination, I would try to see that their medical career was ruined. You felt that strongly? Yes. I don't know how many emotions were in that statement, but I felt like it was uh, one that needed to be said. That's the reason I waited so long. I waited until I felt I'm at the end of my career. I don't fear my peers. 
because I think they believe it too. This is the basement floor. He has been shot. Oswald has been shot. Lee Oswald. Dr. Crenshaw's role in history was not over. Just two days later, another victim of the madness that gripped Dallas was wheeled through this hospital emergency entrance. Lee Harvey Oswald, the accused presidential assassin, was shot. And though mortally wounded, he too was brought here. Inside, there was another urgent rush of medics to the trauma room. Among them, again, the young Dr. Crenshaw. As the team was around him at the table, working, trying to save his life, you were called away. What was that about? The nurse came and tapped me on the shoulder and asked if I would take the phone call. And I picked up the phone and it was like thunder, like God was talking. He said, this is the president, Lyndon B. Johnson. I said, yes, sir. And he said, how is the accused assassin doing? I said, well, he's critical, but right now he is holding his own. He then said, I want you to take a message to the operating surgeon and have a deathbed statement from Oswald. Oswald died on the table without saying a word. Could LBJ have made the call? The answer is yes. 2020 has obtained copies of White House logs from November 24th, 1963. LBJ was in Washington attending church when Oswald was shot at 1221 Eastern Time. And at 1245 p.m., the same time Oswald was in surgery in Dallas, LBJ was first told he had been shot by Secretary of State Dean Rusk. Moments later, LBJ, according to historian William Manchester, said to Robert Kennedy, quote, We've got to do something. We've got to get involved. President Johnson then had 15 minutes to make a call to Dallas before going outside to be with Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy for the procession to the rotunda, where the late President Kennedy would be lying in state. However, there is no official record of this phone call. What could it all mean? If LBJ were on the line to Dr. Crenshaw demanding a deathbed confession, it means the new president was moving quickly to wrap up the case along government lines. How much of that was in the Warren Commission information? None. None at uh, all? I never um, talked to the Warren Commission. Uh, no one knew ever that uh, Lyndon Johnson called Parkland. Today at the School Book Depository Museum, among the exhibits, is a display of a few sketches of the Kennedy autopsy, along with the official explanation that the wounds were from bullets fired only from the rear. What was your reaction when you saw the results, uh, photographs and the sketches from Bethesda, the autopsy done there? I was, it was beyond disbelief for me. I could not believe that a real pathologist would put out something this poorly. Was this the same man you saw as far as uh, John Kennedy, the same body that you observed? Not from the pictures that I saw. And I put him in the coffin. So you say their report in effect is a fraud? I say that it's uh, wrongly done. And the way it was done, maybe they were directed to do it that way. Tom, how does his story compare with that of other doctors who were in that room when the president died? Hugh, most of the doctors there immediately after his death uh, said they thought the gunshots came from the front. But when they got later autopsy information, they changed their mind and either said no, they agreed with the Warren Commission or they weren't sure of the direction. Did you get the feeling that Dr. Crenshaw was waiting rather impatiently all these years for the time to come when he could come forward? I got the feeling that Dr. Crenshaw is a very angry man, that he feels he's had very valuable information which has been withheld for a long period of time. He still carries anger over the way the police, the Secret Service, and the FBI treated the medical staff with guns drawn and sort of took over the situation there. So I think he's glad to vent this. One eyewitness was Malcolm Summers, who reenacted his experience for Nova. After the motor van had passed, I waited about a minute, and then I came running over across to the nose. When I got here, I was stopped by a uni uh, person in a suit with an overcoat over his arm, throw it over his arm. Also had a gun under his arm. It looked like a little machine gun to me, a small machine gun. Malcolm Summers was one of several eyewitnesses, including at least one Dallas policeman, who ran into people claiming to be federal officials and who were never found. Chief Counsel for the House Assassination Committee, Robert Blakey. 
uh, a careful examination of where all of the Secret Service agents were that day uh, and their duty assignments indicates that no Secret Service agent was in that area. Hello, police operator. Go ahead. Go ahead, it says news news. Police. Hello, there's not a shooting out here. Where is it at? It says news and police radio. What location? Between Marcellus and Buckley. It's a police officer. Somebody shot him. What's it? 448 10th Street. 78. It's in a police car. Number 10. Number 10. 78. 78. Hello. Police officer, did you get that? Police officer, 510 East Jefferson. Researcher Dale Myers investigated the Tippett shooting. He certainly couldn't have gotten here unless he got a ride. Now, some people have conjectured that uh, it was possibly a conspiratorial uh, pickup. Whether the driver was a co-conspirator or a casual passerby is still a mystery. The killer gets to about this position on the sidewalk and Tippett's patrol car pulls to the curb and either calls him over to the curb or the man comes over by himself and leans to the window and talks to Tippett through the vent window for 10 or 20 seconds, very short. And Tippett gets out of the patrol car and as he does, the man steps over to the front of the hood here and as Tippett gets opposite him, he pulls a gun from under the jacket, fires three shots across the hood, knocking Tippett to the pavement. Then the man starts to leave, hesitates at the back of the car, walks around behind the car, comes up to the front of the car, stands over Tippett and shoots him in the head. There was a struggle at the time of the rest. There was a struggle in the Texas theater when uh, a Dallas police officer was arresting him and the pistol was snapped at another police officer's head and didn't fire. At that time, a scuffle ensued inside of the Texas theater where he was arrested by six officers. Sir, has that pistol been previously discharged? Yes. Why? After the shooting, police found shells at the scene. They went on the radio and said there were 38 automatics. Later, Oswald's arrested with a revolver that fires 38 specials, a shell that's clearly about a quarter inch longer. Besides, they're clearly stamped on the bottom. One says 38 special, one says 38 automatic. He was taken from us by the fatal bullet of a poor, confused, misguided, ungodly assassin, as was the president of our United States. We think it's appropriate to mention that during the services, the pastor C.D. Tipps Jr. mentioned that J.D. Tippett was an outstanding police officer and also a good family man, a man of deep character. To many people, he was an average American, a good friend. In addition to his work with the Dallas Police Force, in the evenings, he was employed at a donut shop, and on Sundays, his normal day off, he worked at the theater. The Soviet news agency TASS, in its home service, a Russian language service, uh, has reported the following. It is accusing the American police of trying to implicate the Communist Party in the assassination of President Kennedy. It made this comment, the more details are reported, said Toss, the darker and more suspicious the whole case is. It said serious commentators are not putting faith in the police story about left-wing elements being responsible for this monstrous crime. They continue to await the results of further investigation. That is the report from the Soviet press service Toss so far carried only in the Russian language inside of the Soviet Union. In my opinion, he wouldn't have had that. He would have been forced to instruct the jury to return a verdict of not guilty on the ground of insufficient evidence because under Texas law, Article 714 of the Court of Criminal Procedure, a wife cannot give evidence against her husband, nor can she give leads uh, at least to the development of evidence against her husband. And uh, the, base, the primary... Uh, evidence that was so damaging against Oswald, connecting him with a rifle, all came from Marina Oswald. 
When the picture is enlarged and lightened, we can see into the windows of the book depository. We will now zoom into the window at the western end of the sixth floor. This pair of windows is on the extreme opposite end of the depository from the so-called Oswald window. As mentioned, this window has always been cropped out whenever this picture has been printed. We begin to see the image of the face and shoulders of someone in the sixth floor window. Enlarging the image even more, we can clearly make out the shape of a face. The hairline, the forehead, the eyes, nose, mouth, the shoulders. The white spot over his left shoulder is a light fixture on the ceiling. Because of the considerable degree of enlargement of this picture, there is a vast amount of photographic grain. This makes it very difficult for some people to see detail within the photograph. By adding an overlay of an artist's reproduction of the facial features, we can see details that don't reproduce well on videotape. Again, without the overlay, once again with the overlay, and without it. The lighting fixture is still on the ceiling of the depository to this day. Zuerst, ich bin aus allen Wolken gefallen, als ich einmal in Maritas Wohnung war in New York und äh, äh, sie hatte so viele Schuhkäste mit Bildern. Und einmal nahm sie ein Bild daraus und sagte, hier, Joe, das wird dich interessieren. Ich guckte dieses kleine Bild an, so fünf Personen, Marita mit vier anderen, guckte auf das Bild und sagte, das ist Oswald. Lee Harvey, Oswald. Lee Harvey Oswald, der Kennedy ermordet, ermordet hat. Und Marita sagt, er hat nicht Kennedy ermordet, er hat Kennedy gern gehabt. Er hat Respekt vor ihm gehabt, das wäre der Letzte gewesen. Er sagt, wie kommst du zusammen? Er sagt, Asi war in meiner Truppe. Wir, wir haben trainiert in derselben Truppe. Und ich habe gesagt, du hast doch nicht mit der Kennedy ermordung was zu tun. Nein, Marita, das nicht. Das glaube ich jetzt nicht. Fidel Castro, Paris, Jimenez, CIA, aber das, nein. Ich sagte, meine Mutter war da und sagte, ja, doch. <lacht> die, ein, der, die einzigste Person, die darüber etwas wusste, war meine Mutter. Meine Mutter und Marita waren sehr, sehr eng. Und äh, meine Mutter hat mir gesagt, ja, wir wollten nicht, dass du das weißt. Das wäre für dich zu gefährlich. <lacht> <laughs> Her stories about the caravan, I think, are accurate about yeah. the caravan going to Dallas. Dallas. But I wasn't, I wasn't on the caravan. But the story is true. There, uh, there was a caravan went to Dallas that week. How do you know? Because uh, we were invited to go by Sturgis and Diaz Lance and and his brother Marcos Diaz Lance. I'm happy to know that. No, 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 no. Ich wusste nichts mehr als die anderen Passagiere auf dem Flugzeug. Aber ich, äh, aber ich habe meine Gruppe da gelassen und die wollten den Kennedy tot haben. Und dann habe ich gesagt, oh mein Gott, nein, nein, das kann nicht sein. I asked Sturgis, Jesus Christ, Frank, did you shoot the president? Did you have something to do with that? And he said, ah, who gives a shit? Yeah, who's going to prove it? He said, we kill a lot of people. What the hell's the difference? Look what he did to the Bay of Pigs. Look what he did. He left the black people go, gave them all their rights. You know, I didn't, he didn't want Vietnam. You know, they had good reason. And had I gesagt, ich will das nochmal machen. Texas School Book Depository, Elm in Houston. I went to work there yesterday. Here's the depository. In order for the motorcade to pass it, they'd have to make a jog right on Houston Street and left on Elm here, and then through the underpass to Stemmons Freeway. Isn't that a long way around to nowhere? It's the perfect place for triangulated gunfire. A man in the records building here, another man in the depository, a third man here on the grassy knoll where he has excellent cover. They'll have to slow down to 10 to 12 miles an hour to make this turn off. And when they reach this point, they've walked right into the trap. And there's no way they can get out of it.
gun's got a heavy recoil. It won't stand still. And we got just three seconds to nail the president. Let's make my plans and carry him out. That's what John Wilkes Booth thought, too. Booth? <laughs> I'm no actor. Busting my leg on a stage so I can yell down with the tyrants. If Booth wasn't such a ham, he might have made it. He got pretty far at that, though. The guy who killed Garfield didn't make it either. Him? He didn't plan anything. Just took a lucky shot, strictly left-handed, just like McKinley. And Zangara got the cheer for his try at Roosevelt. He had to try it in a crowd. I hate crowds. They're commies. They're enemy agents. <laughs> All right, who is behind it, Baron? I haven't the slightest idea. I have no feeling against the president. I'm just earning a living. By treason. Ace those craps. Don't give me that politics jazz. It's not my racket. I don't even know who's paying me, and I don't want to know. What's the difference? Didn't it occur to you why they want you to do it? Certainly it did. But that makes them suckers, not me. I'm the guy who's getting it made. A half a million clams for absolutely nothing. Because tonight at 5 o'clock, I kill the president. One second after 5, there's a new president. What changes? Nothing. What are they paying for? Nothing. Otherwise, I wouldn't have taken a job, Sheriff. About 200 yards. Baron, isn't that a German rifle? Yeah. You know it? I know it. From Dallas, we got word of some of the details of how President Kennedy died today, as the doctors who attended him were able for the first time to sort of collect their thoughts over that tragic half hour that they fought for his life yesterday. They say at Parkland Hospital that it was really of no use. Immediately and he had just been brought in. It was obvious initially that he had a severe lethal wound. Arriving at the emergency room, uh, Dr. Carrico had placed a tube in the president's trachea to assist his breathing. But there was a neck wound anteriorly and a large wound of his head in the right posterior area. Most of the doctors and nurses who treated the president at Parkland did see a large wound at the rear of the head. Dr. Robert McClelland. It was in the right back part of the head, very large. Nurse Audrey Bell. You know, there was a massive wound at the back of his head. Dr. Charles Carrico. There was a... Uh... A, a large, a, quite a large defect about here on his, on his skull. Dr. Ronald Jones. Well, my impression was that, that there was a wound in, in this area of the head, right in, right in this area. Dr. Paul Peters. Right about there is where I thought the hole was. Occipital parietal. Dr. Kenneth Salyer. Into the temporal parietal back into the parietal area which is this is the parietal bone right here and this wound extended into the parietal into the parietal area dr charles crenshaw and you'll hold right here on your ear to the back and this bone that's on the back of your head is called the occiput right between these two points was the large exit wound about two and three-fourths of an inch the size of my fist. Dr. Richard Delaney. Uh, so that was my remembering of, uh, of what I saw. He shot to kill, he shot with deadly accuracy. Using a bolt action rifle, he fired three bullets unusually swiftly as if he had trained for this murder for a long time. A definite air of anticipation. Ruby, enter Dorothy Kilgallen star reporter and columnist for New York's Journal American. The inquisitive journalist landed a secret interview with Ruby during his incarceration in Dallas. The following March, Kilgallen wrote in her column, The point in this historic case is that the whole truth has not been told. Biographer Johnny Whiteside. She was interviewing all sorts of people really deep, deep into the case and running just series after series of stories in the New York Journal American that were asking a lot of seemingly unanswerable questions. And she started saying, this has to be a conspiracy. But before Dorothy had a chance to publish her findings, the 52-year-old writer was found dead in her New York City townhouse. 
How she wound up that way is anyone's guess. I think it's highly suspicious that Dorothy dies after saying she's going to bust this case wide open and have the scoop of the century, the biggest story of all time. Are you an adorable gentleman who is noted for one particular feature? <laughs> Alone amongst the mainstream press reporters, Dorothy began harboring suspicions that the so-called open and shut case against Lee Harvey Oswald was not so open and shut. Dorothy was finding dissident witnesses, uh, deposing them, publishing their testimony. She was going to Dallas. She was threatening to, to, to publish finally and saying it would be the biggest story of her life. Dorothy somehow obtained the Warren Commission report testimony given by Jack Ruby while he was in prison, while it was still classified top secret. She had found, I think, several hundred discrepancies in the Warren Commission report. All our phones were tapped because they were trying to figure out how she had gotten that. She said she was going to blow the JFK to try to help the president, that uh, he was beyond help when he reached the hospital within five minutes of the uh, shooting. They said that the bullet that entered his neck came out the back of his head, and it was quite clear when well, he how did it happen? Uh, who saw it happen? We have some eyewitness reports. ABC's Bill Lord interviewed some people. First, a Dallas policeman, an eyewitness to the shooting. Uh, Jim Cheney, I understand that you were riding next to the president's car when the assassination took place. I was riding on the right rear fender of what happened. Well, we had proceeded west on uh, Elm Street uh, at approximately 15 to 20 miles an hour. When we heard the first shot, I thought it was a motorcycle backfiring. And uh, I looked back over to my left, and uh, also President Kennedy looked back over his left shoulder. Then the, uh, when the second shot came, well, it, uh, I looked back just in time to see the president struck in the face by the second bullet. President Kennedy, we are now informed, was shot in the right temple. Well, well, Bob, from the point where they think the man with the gun might have been seen yeah. to where the president was actually felled, would it have been possible for him to have been struck by a bullet in the right temple? We know that Mr. Kennedy was hit in the right and temple. We know, of course, that the president was killed by one shot that struck him in the right temple. He died of a gunshot wound in the brain. Dr. Berkeley told me it's a, a simple matter, Tom, of, uh, of a bullet right through the head. This uh, hypothesis that the assailant was in the building I described is true. But this conflicts with the fact that the wound in the neck, the doctors say, was in the front of the neck just below the Adam's apple. I was having lunch in the main cafeteria in the hospital when an emergency page arrived for Dr. Tom Charge, chief of surgery. Knowing that he was presenting a paper out of town, we picked up the page. Dr. Ronald Jones, surgery resident myself, they informed us that the president had been shot and was being brought to the emergency room. We went there. It has built up here in downtown Dallas, Dallas in front of the county jail. The county jail is where 24-year-old Lee Oswald is expected to be brought any time now. And if you'll join me over here, why, we'll let the audience in the theater and the audience at home know exactly what your line is. <laughs> All right. Panel, I will admit we're being tricky, and we have uh, perhaps three and a half minutes to see what you can do. We'll tell you that Miss Kane is self-employed and deals in a service, and we'll begin with Dorothy Kilgallen. Could I use your service, Miss Kane? I think so. Uh, could Mr. Randall? Yes. You're quite sure about him, aren't you? Reasonably. Well... You may be, Miss Kane. <laughs> uh, if, if we had need of your service, would we go to you rather than ringing you up and summoning you? Dorothy Kilgallen, sharp-witted TV personality and skillful journalist. From the 1930s to the 60s, Kilgallen was one of the most powerful women in print. With a single mention, the cunning columnist could make or break a career. She was a wonderful writer, wonderful reporter. Dorothy, yes? st stop the presses, tear out the front page, if I got a story for you. Is it bigger than a bread box? Uh, 
If you got on her bad side, she'd let you have it. This is Milton Berle. Oh, there's a product involved. Product? Corn. <laughs> Dorothy was, despite the controversy that swirls around her, a very bright and very good reporter of criminal cases, one of the best ever. She had uh, stumbled across something really big. She did know too much. Uh, her death is very mysterious. I mean, if they killed the president, they're not going to worry about a Broadway columnist like Dorothy Kilgallen, right? November 1963. The country was thrown into turmoil when President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Lee Harvey Oswald was accused of the killing. Then Oswald was shot dead by Jack 